A listener note, this episode of Killer Psyche contains very graphic descriptions of torture and murder. Please be advised. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines legend as an old story that is widely believed but cannot be proven true. The legend of Elizabeth Bathory, a Hungarian countess whose reign of torture and terror spanned the late 16th and early 17th centuries, is filled with gore, drama, and tales that include taking baths in the blood of her victims. And that is partly how she earned her nickname, the Blood Countess. There are details in her story that can be verified through historical documents, letters, and other primary sources. These tell the story of a woman who remains the most prolific female serial killer known to this day. That's a little fact I like to bring up to those who believe that there are no female serial killers. According to legend, the number of murders committed by the Countess is 600, but documents only confirm about 200 victims, mostly young girls and women. But I would say that number is bad enough. What makes these murders all the more shocking and tragic is the horrific torture she inflicted upon her victims before she killed them. She was every bit as sadistic and bloodthirsty as the legendary nickname she earned, if not even more so. From Wondery Entry for I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the second season of Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is Elizabeth Bathory, the Blood Countess. You've heard me talk about our effort to avoid trauma porn on this podcast. The same goes for torture porn. If you're not familiar with these terms, they mean the trauma or the torture drive the plot and are often exploitative. In sexual porn, the whole point is to watch the sex act. No one cares about the who or the why it's solely about the act itself. Some non-porn movies contain sex scenes, but most of those films also have storylines and develop characters. The sex scenes are not the only reason that people are watching. In the world of true crime, there is a good amount of torture and trauma porn. People tend to focus on the deviant and salacious details of whatever violence was committed at the expense of the victim. I'm happy to say Killer Psyche is not that podcast. And that distinction is what makes this episode especially difficult to do. Countess Elizabeth Bathory was truly one of the most depraved and sadistic beings that I have ever studied. To be able to give you a true sense of her base depravity, I had to dive into some of her more deviant acts, which does feel a bit like the glorification of torture. So I'm going to give you only a few examples of the horrors inflicted by the Countess. 
From the late 1500s until her arrest in December of 1610, Elizabeth Bathory tortured and killed hundreds of young women and girls. The various ways in which she committed these unspeakable acts range from simply beating them to death to slowly flaying them alive and making them consume their own flesh. She and her dedicated group of five servants took hot pokers to their victims' genitals, stuffed their mouths with burning embers, and sewed their lips together. She would slowly dissect girls while they were alive or make them stand naked in freezing water. She also had various cages and contraptions she used to starve and torture her victims. I could go on and on, but you get the point. There was nothing off limits for Elizabeth, as long as the victim suffered and it was slow. At first, these acts were perpetrated on the young and innocent. Elizabeth only targeted local peasants, but soon she depleted her victim pool, leaving her to go after young noble women. But that was not the only reason she sought them out. In addition to the servants that helped her, Elizabeth relied on a woman known as the Forest Witch. Back in the 16th century, women who practiced folk art and herbal medicine were labeled witches. As Elizabeth descended further into madness, she relied on the forest witch to help her navigate the world. It was due to her influence that Elizabeth began practicing what she believed to be black magic. She used it to deal with political matters and social issues rather than simply using diplomacy. It was the forest witch that told Elizabeth she needed to target noble women. She convinced her that their blood would have a more powerful effect in casting spells than the blood of peasant women. So, in 1610, the Countess opened a finishing school of sorts for high-born young women. This not only helped bring in some extra income, but it also gave her a new source of potential victims. It seems apparent that the aristocracy had not heard the rumors of the Countess's cruel and sadistic deeds and were happy to send their daughters to learn from someone with her high social standing. And this was the beginning of her undoing. When the daughters of nobility who were sent to her school began to disappear and die, attention was drawn to her. Bathory's staff begged her to stop, but Elizabeth would not, and most likely could not have stopped easily. After hearing from both nobles and clergy about the vile deeds being committed by Countess Bathory, the king, along with several of his lords, decided to pay her a visit at her castle on Christmas Eve of 1610. Panicked, Elizabeth summoned the forest witch and asked her to make something that would render her invisible. After hours of trying to make that work, she baked a cake that was poisoned and tried to cast a spell over it. The spell did not work, but the poison did. The king and his party became very ill and suspected what she had done. Four days later, on December 29, 1610, soldiers stormed Elizabeth's castle. When they entered, they found the bodies of dead or dying girls lying all over. They encountered four of her servants, torturing young women, and promptly arrested all of them. The townspeople came to watch 
as Elizabeth was escorted to her tower dungeon. Along the way, more mutilated bodies were found. Her noble status kept her out of jail, and she was moved back to the main house where she stayed under house arrest until her trial. But the Countess Bathory's reign of terror was finally over. Elizabeth Bator, also known in English as Elizabeth Bathory, was born on August 7, 1560, in a small town in eastern Hungary. Her parents came from two separate branches of the Bathory family, and the merging of these two factions formed a family whose wealth rivaled Hungarian royalty. Elizabeth spent most of her childhood in one of her family's estates near the Romanian border, away from the battles raging all over her country. It was a tense period. Turkish invaders were converging on Hungary. The Protestant Reformation was underway all over Europe. Islamic Turks were at odds with the European Christians and Catholics were clashing with Protestants. Blood was spilt on all sides over competing religious ideologies. When Elizabeth was six years old, the fighting stopped, temporarily. Her parents made sure she continued to receive a comprehensive education, which was not typical then, especially for girls. Elizabeth's education set her apart at a time when most people, nobility and aristocrats included, could neither read nor write. She was an outstanding student and succeeded in math and classical studies. And she even read and wrote five languages. Elizabeth also demanded to be treated as well as her male relatives. She often dressed up as a boy and participated in activities that were only permitted for men. But she also enjoyed dressing up like a young lady. She was reportedly a perfectionist, spending hours adorning herself with jewels. And if she did not get her way, she would throw hysterical fits. It was said that Elizabeth's fits of rage were learned behavior from her father. She also suffered from seizures and migraines for the majority of her life, starting in childhood. There is no known connection between seizures and criminal behavior. We do know that brain damage in early life is frequently seen in serial killers, but there is no known connection to migraines and or epilepsy. However, if her seizures were not caused by epilepsy, but were caused by brain trauma, such as an injury suffered in childhood, then yes, that could contribute to a violent nature later in life. There are stories claiming that mental illness was rampant in her family. Though unconfirmed, this is not surprising. Some noble and royal families were inbred back then, and with that comes the possibility of mental issues. In the Middle Ages, royalty and nobility often married relatives to protect property, wealth, and position. However, the prestige and power the Bathory family had was not merely the result of inheritance or good luck— They were known for their bravery, cunning, and superior intelligence. Elizabeth's beauty and brains made her a great asset to her parents. At the time, young girls from noble families got engaged during childhood. In 1571, 
11-year-old Elizabeth made an impressive match to a 16-year-old count from a family whose wealth was close to her own. The following year, their engagement was finalized, and Elizabeth was sent to live out the remainder of her adolescence at her future in-law's estate. There, she learned to run the estate and the staff. She had to adapt very quickly to these new surroundings, and she was expected to act appropriate to her station as a noblewoman and wife. This proved to be a problem for Elizabeth, who enjoyed her tomboy lifestyle and was used to getting her way through her temper tantrums. It is believed that this caused a great deal of trouble for her in her new court. There were also well-documented rumors from two years before her marriage about Elizabeth having had an affair with another young man one that resulted in a pregnancy. The child was swiftly removed from her in-law's estate and taken somewhere else to be raised in secret. The story goes on to say that her fiancé was so upset that he had the young man castrated and parts of him, I will let you guess which ones, fed to the dogs. The Countess's parents did not live to see her married. And by the time of her wedding, she had inherited much of the family's vast property holdings and wealth. Her in-laws had passed away as well, leaving Elizabeth and her war hero husband as one of the wealthiest couples in Hungary. Their land holdings and money surpassed even the king. Collectively, they own thousands of acres of land and more than 20 castles across Eastern Europe. After her marriage, Elizabeth maintained a lifestyle typical of noble women of that time. However, several attributes set her apart. First, she kept her own name after marriage. She believed her family name was more prestigious than her husband's. Secondly, owing to her intelligence and education, she was more involved in the family business and took over all aspects of managing their land holdings. Nobility back then usually owned the towns and villages around their estates, so Elizabeth took charge of theirs. But the powers of nobles reached even further They served as judge and jury to the local townspeople and could even sentence someone to death. Because most men were constantly away at war, the workforce was seriously depleted. Nobles ordered peasants in their villages to work for them two or three days each week for free. And because peasants were considered property, nobles could do with them whatever they wanted. The first 10 years of Elizabeth's marriage were said to be unremarkable with regard to the egregious torture behavior that later defined her. 10 years into her marriage, Elizabeth gave birth to a daughter. She went on to have two more as well as two sons. She was reportedly a kind and caring mother to her own children. Elizabeth's husband was captain of the Hungarian army, so he was away a lot. In his absence, she spent a great deal of time with a woman named Anna, who became her mentor, teaching her how to inflict pain and suffering on others. Anna worked for Elizabeth's husband's family before coming to work for her as a gatekeeper and personal advisor. Anna, a peasant, was described by her peers as a, quote, wild beast in human form. She taught the countess and a few of the other servants various methods of torture. Her favorite, though, was to beat someone repeatedly, 
until they died. The townspeople began whispering about the torture chamber and butcher shop on the estates. And even though the rumors did not include the countess and her husband, their complicitness and suspected approval concerned the commoners. What castle outsiders did not know, but the servants inside did, was that their bosses were not only aware of what Anna was doing, they were joining her. In fact, the Count taught his wife and Anna torture techniques he learned on the battlefield. Anna made sure all their victims were virginal peasant girls. She knew the authorities would not bother to look into these deaths. And when they did ask questions, the Countess just blamed their deaths on disease. The local clergy began denouncing the Count and Countess at church services, and they called Anna, quote, the executioner woman. When the church threatened the noble couple with excommunication, a sizable donation was made to the ministry, and the problem went away. It was rumored that the Count forbid killing the young women, but torture That was fine by him. He even bought his wife gifts to aid her depraved acts, such as a device with knives shaped like sharp claws that she could use to stab or slash a victim. And he made servant girls stand in the hot sun, naked and covered with honey, so swarms of insects could attack them. If a young girl passed out, He stuck pieces of oiled paper between her toes and then lit the papers on fire. While the Count was alive, Elizabeth did her best to hide any servant deaths from him. Her approach to torture was slow and methodical. At first, she just bit or kicked her victim, but the intensity and violence increased over time. I could give you specifics on the torture she inflicted on these poor victims. But frankly, they really disturbed me. And if they bother me, I don't think it's appropriate to share them with you. But if you're curious, there's plenty of information on the Countess Bathory out there. Suffice it to say, these acts were horrible. But they were not fatal. Just like any other person who engages in interpersonal violence, such as serial rape and murder, they often start out slowly and work their way up to more violent behavior as they learn what they like. They are acting out a fantasy. For the sadist, they may start with a pinch or a slap. If they get away with that act, and there was no one around to stop the Countess, then they slowly increased the variety and intensity of their cruelty. Remember, the sadist does not derive pleasure from actually inflicting pain. Their pleasure comes from the victim's response to it. The screaming, the moaning, crying, the pleading, the fear in their eyes, all of that is what the sadist lives for. For them, once the victim dies, the party is over. Why? Because the victim can no longer react to their torture. And the victim's reaction is the only thing the sadist wants from the victim. There are different types of sadism, some of which we have previously discussed on other episodes of Killer Psyche. They are emotional sadism. That's enjoying the misfortunes and sadness of others, especially if the sadist caused it. For example, I'm going to take you out this weekend to the best restaurant in town. It will be our special night. And they say that knowing they have no intention of doing it. Then they cancel the big event at the last minute. 
the other person's disappointment is enjoyable to them. That's why they did it. That is emotional sadism. The next type is sexual sadism. And for the sexual sadist, they become sexually aroused at the physical suffering of others. And then there's physical sadism, which is what Bathory was mostly doing to her victims. Hands-on infliction of pain, all kinds of it, because she liked it. As far as we know, Elizabeth Bathory was a physical sadist. She enjoyed the pain, suffering, and humiliation she caused others through the infliction of physical abuse, which included submersion in freezing water or withholding food, causing a slow death by starvation. By the way, starvation and submerging the victim in cold water or exposing them to other difficult environmental factors are two favorite behaviors of sadists. So how does someone become a sadist? No one knows definitely why some people are sadists. Are they born that way? Is it learned behavior? Or can the roots of sadism be spawned by a childhood adolescent exposure to an image of a sadistic act, many of which are depicted in art and literature. Let's explore that. One of the most infamous serial killers of women, Ted Bundy, shortly before his execution, gave an interview to an FBI profiler and said that he believes violent pornography of men dominating women that he was exposed to as a very young teenager affected him in a profoundly negative and sexual way. He does not blame the pornography for killing 33 young women, but he does think it influenced him on his path to murder. In other cases, sadistic behavior can be taught from an adult to their own child, and I am aware of just such a case in which a sadistic rapist took his son along with him when he victimized women. When his son was young, he made him watch. When he was older, he had his son assist him. Later, he encouraged his teenage son to join in the abuse and sex acts. And finally, when the boy was old enough, he became a predatory sadistic rapist who acted on his own. Lastly, some convicted serial sadists, rapists, and killers have claimed that they had no particular issues in their childhood at all that foreshadowed what they later became and the crimes they committed. Jeffrey Dahmer and Dennis Rader, also known as BTK, are cases in point. So, is that the result of them simply losing the DNA dice toss? Probably it is. No one knows, including researchers and psychologists, what actually causes sadism. But theories abound. Many experts believe sadism is a form of escapism, that it transports the practitioner to a sense of power. And power very well may be something they lack in their everyday life. So having power over another person feels great. So then why do sadists enjoy the suffering of others? Because the sadistic act is driven by a desire to experience power and dominance over another person and it is frequently accompanied by sexual pleasure and satisfaction. And that is an extremely powerful reinforcement for inflicting torture. We do not know if the Countess was turned on sexually by her cruelty, but it is crystal clear that she had absolute power and control over all her victims, not only physically, but geographically as well. And what I mean by that is 
they couldn't leave. She also had them under control monetarily, meaning they had no money and were dependent on her for everything. So was Elizabeth Bathory a psychopath, a sadist, or both? Without a doubt, she was both. Psychopathy is, according to the DSM-5, a personality disorder. A personality disorder, and there are 10 of them, as defined by the American Psychiatric Association, is a way of thinking, feeling, and behaving that makes a person different from most other people. An individual's personality is influenced by experiences, environment, and inherited characteristics. These disorders usually surface in adolescence, and a person's personality typically stays the same over time. But wait, there is more. Sadism and psychopathy are associated with another personality disorder, narcissism. And if all that weren't enough, the Countess, who seems to have been a walking, talking, medieval DSM-0, had one more annoying trait, Machiavellianism. To be clear, this is not a personality disorder. It is a trait. But what does it mean? Niccolo Machiavelli was an Italian diplomat and author of the famous book, The Prince. Machiavellian traits are characterized by several things. First, a profound indifference to morality and the accepted rules of society. Second, an inability to feel empathy or remorse for their own bad deeds. They are highly manipulative because they prefer to act that way rather than be straightforward with people. And lastly, their own personal gain supersedes everything else, including the demise of others they perceive as a threat to their ego. These three personality traits, psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism, are called the dark triad, or dark factor of personality the D factor for short. In an article posted in Psychology Today on September 1st, 2021, about the dark triad, one psychologist said, if you never met someone with a dark triad personality, consider yourself lucky. He goes on to say, they have a wide range of unpleasant interpersonal behavior. This means they are aggressive, coercive, manipulative, and can be violent even in the workplace. They are hedonistic and use people for sex. It might best sum up the dark triad personality to say that it has been associated with the seven deadly sins. We know that the Countess committed her torture and murders with at least one other person. So, did her servants have the same diagnosis as she did? Possibly, but we must bear in mind that she was not only their employer, they saw her as their queen. They had to do what she asked or suffer serious consequences. And many of them, no doubt, were afraid of her. Wouldn't you be? Nevertheless, it isn't surprising that she engaged others in her actual torture. We see this in serial killer partners now and then. The dynamic of sharing anything, whether it be a fine meal, a fun event, or something as horrific as a torture murder, is the same. According to Psychology Today, it's not at all uncommon for violent people to enjoy the company of someone just like them. And it also serves to reinforce to each other that what they are doing is okay. Kind of a partners in crime thing. And make no mistake, the Countess knew what she was doing was wrong. 
Due to her station, no one challenged the countess, and her husband was an added layer of protection. He was known as the Black Knight of Hungary, who kept their country safe from invading Turks. He lent so much money to the king that the royal couldn't even afford to pay him back. These advantages kept the couple safe from any real threats of legal action that could have stopped them. The prosecutor back then could not actually bring charges against the nobility on behalf of a person who was considered lowborn. Peasants had to file against nobles themselves, which was very risky and unlikely to come out in their favor. Elizabeth was very good at covering her tracks. She had cordoned off a section of the castle that no one, except for a select few, had access to. She posted a male guard at the entrance and had the areas meticulously cleaned whenever guests would enter the castle. To the outside world, Elizabeth and her husband seemed kind and generous. They created scholarships aided the needy, including loans to their staff struggling to pay bills. But those on the inside, they knew the truth. After the Count died in 1604, Elizabeth's attacks escalated. She was feeling the pinch financially. She was no longer receiving her husband's military income. And although her vast properties generated great wealth, she had what we call today a cash flow problem. As the stress on Elizabeth mounted, she lashed out even more frequently and more cruelly. Compounding this, the war was raging all around her. And then, a year after her husband's death, her brother died. Apparently, this was the breaking point for Elizabeth. Social functions, illnesses, money woes, any added stress seemed to propel her into a murderous rampage. She began killing young women at an alarming rate, even killing some in carriages while she traveled, burying them alongside the roads. If she was ill, she would have the girls brought to her room and would torture them from her bed, biting pieces of flesh off of them. It seemed she was addicted to torture. But in fact, I think it wasn't so much an addiction as it was a coping mechanism. The joy she got from being physically sadistic to young women made her feel good. It was a release from the stress she was under. She also employed three other women and one man in addition to Anna, and she had them torture the girls. There were so many dead women that there was no longer anywhere to bury them. So the staff began throwing their bodies over the castle walls. In addition to torture, the Countess was obsessed with her appearance. It was said that she sat or stood in front of a mirror for hours and would then go on a rampage, smashing all the mirrors in the house. Elizabeth had been considered beautiful, and she still was, but she feared that aging was destroying her looks. Her forest witch convinced her that She had to bathe in the blood of young virgins to rejuvenate her youthful appearance. I can't imagine that she literally sat in a tub filled with blood. She most likely rubbed the blood onto her skin. In the end, Elizabeth believed she'd never be held responsible for her crimes. And believing that she could murder anyone she chose and poison a king shows Elizabeth's grandiosity. I can do anything and it will be fine because I am 
me. That's how a dark triad personality thinks. We look at her actions and say, she must have been detached from reality, but she was not at all. The fact that she lied about the whereabouts of the people she killed proves she knew that killing them was wrong and would get her in trouble. Remember, she was cunning, calculating, and capable of planning her murders. And that means she was not psychotic. She was also no longer able to maintain her public persona as a kind, generous woman. She had become sloppy when it came to covering up her crimes. Her secrets were getting exposed to the world. And with her wealth dwindling and her husband dead, there was no one who could save Elizabeth this time, especially from herself. The Countess's castle was raided on December 29, 1610. Afterward, she gave a statement declaring her innocence and blaming her four servants. By this time, Anna was dead, and so the remaining servants, three women and one man, blamed everything on her, each other, and the Countess. On January 2nd, 1611, the trial of the Countess's four servants began. Although they had turned on each other and accused local peasants of cooperating in their crimes, all of them seemed to agree that Anna was the ringleader and the cruelest of them all. It is called the empty chair defense, blaming someone who is not there to defend themselves From the research I've done, it is most likely true that Anna was the one in charge. Running concurrently with that trial was the criminal investigation against Elizabeth. The prosecution called over 300 witnesses to testify against Elizabeth and the servants. The evidence was overwhelming and undeniable. However, Elizabeth maintained her innocence, claiming she was being persecuted by the clergy and by those who wanted her land. There is truth in that statement. People did want her land. It was valuable. Also, many of the nobles and royals owed her family money, and if she were convicted, their debts would go away. But even at her worst, Elizabeth was savvy. When she realized she was in trouble, she drew up a new will and divided her property equally among her three living children. So the majority of the land stayed in the family. Elizabeth's servants were quickly found guilty. Two of the women who were considered primary participants had their fingers torn off and were then killed and cremated. The male was beheaded and burned, and the third woman was put back into a dungeon, and her fate is unknown. A few weeks later, the forest witch was tried and condemned to death as a witch. She was burned at the stake. Elizabeth desperately wanted to testify for herself, but she was not allowed. There was no trial in order to protect the names and legacies of Elizabeth and her husband. Also, nobles did not want to set a precedent that they could be killed for crimes against lower-born individuals. Refusing to be defeated, Elizabeth tried one last move. She financed her cousin, who was leading a rebellion against the king. The idea being, she could gain a powerful ally who could help her escape. But 
For the Lord in charge of her sentencing, this was the last straw. According to court documents, he said, quote, You, Elizabeth, are like a wild animal. You are in the last months of your life. You do not deserve to breathe the air on earth or see the light of the Lord. You shall disappear from this world and shall never reappear in it again. As the shadows envelop you, you may find time to repent your bestial life. I hereby condemn you, Lady Bathory, to lifelong imprisonment in your own castle. In December of 1611, Elizabeth's sentence was carried out and she was walled into a room in her castle. Only a single space was left in the bricks, just large enough to pass through food, supplies, and waste. She lived two and a half years in confinement, mostly in solitude. She spent much of that time writing letters, declaring her innocence, and demanding an appeal. When she ran out of parchment, she wrote on the walls. On August 21st, 1614, Elizabeth became concerned that her hands were cold and told the guards that she had poor circulation. They told her it was nothing and to lie down. Reportedly, she sang until she fell asleep. And in the middle of that night, Countess Elizabeth Bathory, who had brought incalculable pain and suffering to hundreds of victims and their loved ones, had the luxury that she denied so many others. She died peacefully in her sleep. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Story research and additional writing by Anne Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Senior audio producer, Maxwell Carney. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is our production manager. Brandon Clark, Lindsay Whistler, Colin Modell, and Jada Williams are production assistants. Oscar Guido is the producer from Tree Fort Media. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Joaquin. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Tree Fort, and Marshall Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media.